How the hell did Uber go from idea to multi-billion dollar company in just a few years? How did Skims go from what is that to billion dollar company in one year? What are these companies doing that we are not? What have they figured out? What are their underlying principles? What secrets do they know that we don't? And most importantly, how can we apply these strategies to our current businesses? Why do I have a unicorn emoji next to my name on my LinkedIn and my WhatsApp and my Instagram? I get this question all the time. It's because my goals are in the billions. Unicorn equals a billion dollar startup. And maybe yours are equally as big. If so, Blitzscaling is a must read. Or if you don't wanna read it, just keep listening and I'll share you all of the details. Blitzscaling is not your local farmer's market side hustle or your bath bomb Etsy store. This is not your print on demand t-shirt company or your local cafe, not really. We're talking generationally defining, world altering, zeitgeist disrupting, multi-billion dollar, admittedly mostly software and platform based company. Those who have called into question the tried and true dogmatism that's still taught from the soon to be irrelevant and outdated textbooks of even the quote unquote best business schools in the world. These are the companies who frenetically scaled from, wait, who is that? To a household name in just a few short years. You know them, the Twitters, the Ubers, Apples, Amazons, Airbnbs, Facebook, Google, these types of companies. The Slacks, Instagram, Snapchats, Alibabas, PayPals, and yes, the LinkedIn's as well, which sold for $36 billion with a B, by the way, $36 billion to Microsoft. This elevated our author, Reid Hoffman, from mere success story to iconoclastic luminary, a titan of the modern economy. He started PayPal and LinkedIn. Not a bad decade, huh? These giant killer disruptors literally have changed the way that we interact with the world on a daily basis. Call them companies if you want, but really they're inventions. And yet they seemingly came out of nowhere. You have General Electric or Johnson & Johnson, JP Morgan, Walmart, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's, sure. But they took on average 50 years to become household names. There is sometimes an insane, insane advantage to being first to market. And when that advantage is profound enough, it may be necessary to favor speed over efficiency. Even if you're not certain of the future ahead, even if you can't predict the outcome, if the potential opportunity is big enough, then it's worth it to do what Facebook did, move fast and break things. Because well, sometimes in life, you need to build your Lego house brick by brick, slowly chipping away at your life a little bit at a time. Most of the time, slow and steady and profitable is a preferred method of growth. Like for a company without product market fit or with a physical product that requires massive factory expansion or with your physical health, for example, work out too intensely or go on too strict of a diet or cut something out too cold turkey and you might literally die. But in some situations, especially in business, when you get an unexpected opportunity of a lifetime, when your life is showing you that there's some product market fit and that the Venn diagram of trend meets your product fits like a glove, when there is a chink in your opponent's armor, when there is a vulnerable point to expose, when there is such a critical battle that if won, you could change the outcome of the entire war, in those situations, you gotta go all in. Push the pedal to the floor despite your car shaking and rattling along the way. Or as Reed Hoffman puts it, sometimes, you need to jump off the cliff and build the airplane on the way down. In fact, Reed even puts it more extremely than most in that he says often you first must build the engine before the wings to build up speed first. What does that even mean? An engine without wings? Well, it just means that you're gonna fall down faster, which is pressure packed, yes, but such is the reality of profound opportunity. You have to act fast. Think of day traders, for example. One hour of hesitation is literally millions of dollars. So in the form of a business, blitz scaling looks something like this. You start a company and you build it out until you've reached product market fit. You can tell that there's product market fit for your product or your service, but you also know that your competitors are lurking in the wings conspiring to outwit, outwork, outmarket, and outproduce you. And so, what do you do? Do you steady grow, hoping you win by simply having a better product or customer service at scale? Well, no, at least not in the beginning. Because here's the thing, there is such a massive advantage to being the number one person in the market. Think of Kleenex. Their brand is now synonymous with tissue because they invented it, or Coca-Cola because they invented the category of cola or McDonald's. They were literally the first 
fast food restaurant. In the 22 immutable laws of marketing, law number one is be first. And rule number two is if you're not first, invent a new category so you're first anyway. There are countless examples. The point is, as Reed references in the book, there is often a Glen Gary, Glen Ross race to the top nowadays, whereby the first prize is a Cadillac. The second prize, a few steak knives. And third place, you're fired. The goal then is to be first place. And to do so, it will take two major ingredients. You will need to scale as quickly as possible, often burning through capital along the way. So you'll therefore also need to, too, be okay with inefficiency. An incredible recent example of this is ClickUp. Asana, Monday, Airtable, and Trello were all massive incumbents. But then ClickUp came along and said, I will take all of your features and put them into one software. And then my billboards will be so plentiful, like the Persian Empire in the movie 300, they will blot out the sun. And it worked, or so far it is presently working. The point is, when you see an opportunity, you have to pounce. You'll hire the wrong people. You'll put employees in uncomfortable positions. Your average order value will be lower than your cost of acquiring a customer. You'll lose money up front most of the time. You'll expand without fully weaponizing your lifetime value optimization machine. Your customer service will probably be horrendous. Your churn will be outrageous. Clients and customers will leave you one-star reviews on Google. Your glass door will be embarrassing. You'll have fires burning all around of you and at all times. You probably won't have any proper HR procedures. Your lawyers will be mad at you if you have any lawyers. Your accounting will be sometimes updated Excel sheets. It'll feel like a tornado, an earthquake. There'll be no home base. The world spinning out of control seemingly at all times. And yet, you'll be growing. And if you grow fast enough, if you scale quickly enough, if you pull it off without dying, you will then have the advantage of dominating the market. Now, the proud owner of that first place prize, the Cadillac. And also remember, there's even another advantage because you will now have gone through such fire you will have spent your time improving rather than thinking or ruminating, acting instead of contemplating. You will have therefore gone through so many more iterations of your product than your competitors along the way, which guess what that means? That means by the time that you're ready to clean up the mess that you've created while scaling so quickly, you'll now most likely have the also best product because you'll have gone through more data and more data equals more iterations and more iterations equals a better product. The juice will have been worth the squeeze. Now, if you remember this from other episodes, this is going to require that you are not a perfectionist, which is a massive advantage if you're able to shoot before you aim. In fact, this is one of Reed's most famous quotes. If you aren't embarrassed by the first version of your product, you didn't launch early enough. Meaning come up with as many business ideas as possible. Test them as quickly as possible. Test them for cheaply as possible. Then, once you have product market spit, build a small team around you around the one thing that works. And if there is a massive benefit from being first to market in your industry or area, then gather the necessary team and throw gasoline on the fire. And by the way, this seems like it mostly applies to two-sided marketplaces like Upwork or Uber or dating sites because the people in these businesses are the product or platforms as a service like Udemy or Airbnb because they have two-sided funnels or softwares because once a company neuro links in with a major software provider, it's nearly impossible for them to cancel because the average order value to lifetime value ratio is so screwed up in the beginning especially. And I acknowledge that, but speaking from experience, Blix scaling can also apply to any business as long as they first struck gold. For example, if you find an ad that's crushing, crank the ad. I remember one day when I was the CEO of Mentorbox a few years ago, we spent almost $100,000 in one day on Facebook ads because we found such a killer creative that matched with a new headline. It was cutting like butter. So what did we do? We scaled it to $100,000 a day. Or if you find an offer that crushes, a lot of these AI offers right now are doing really well because it's riding the wave of a current trend, then crank it. Or if you find that you're one of only a few providers of a newly, highly needed service, like how my company, Virtual Worker Now, is doing outsourced social media management for some of the biggest content creators and companies in the world. Why? Because after COVID, businesses realized that they didn't have to pay in-house video editors and in-house copywriters $80,000 a year anymore. 
we're writing this huge aha moment for the entire world economy, which is to say that businesses are finally realizing that they can outsource not just customer service, but also highly skilled creatives, which is why we grew from just a few employees to 400 in just a few years. Or if you're an influencer, leverage that influence to get equity in a company like the Kardashians did. Kim is now a billionaire, not because of the brand shout outs she had, because now she's shouting out her own company, her beauty company and Skims. Same for Kylie Cosmetics. Who knows what will happen to their influence in five years? We don't know, but also who cares? They jumped on the opportunity and leveraged it to generational wealth. And do not sleep on these business deals, by the way. They will be studied for decades in business school to come. Or if you find that your social media channel found a spark, like my business partner's channel, which grows at literally thousands of subscribers a day now. Push it harder, post more, do more, and do not rest on your laurels. These opportunities do not come very often. Or if you find that you have a line out the door at your brick and mortar store, don't take your profits and go on vacation. Double down, hire an agency, hire five agencies, do more and more and more advertising. Opportunities in business really rarely come along. And when they do, regardless of which type of company you have, you gotta push. Which according to the book, here's exactly how he recommends doing it step by step. One, embrace the chaos which inevitably follows. It's going to be ugly at first. That's okay. It's part of the process. You can clean it up later. Two, hire Miss Right Now instead of Miss Right. You may have to promote someone who is grossly not ready for the job in the long run, but in the beginning, just fill the holes. Again, you can clean it up later. Then you'll have to three, tolerate bad management along the way. Your management will be inefficient in the beginning. Your meetings will be sporadic and too long. You'll change communication channels all the time. Whatever, just go with the flow. Blitz scaling is messy. I know, by the way, what you're thinking. Chaos, hiring wrong people, tolerating bad management. These rules seem counterintuitive, and Reed even acknowledges this. But also remember, speed of scale over efficiency. So with that framing in your brain, these rules actually make sense. Now, okay, what else? We must also, four, launch products and ideas that embarrass you as we previously discussed. Remember, test, 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 and then test again. Then five, let unimportant fires burn. Don't get caught up in the small stuff. Read, let PayPal's customer service reach ridiculously bad levels, for example, letting that fire burn while they were scaling. Though you'll also have to sometimes six, do a few things that don't scale. Like for example, the Airbnb founders, they did all of the photography for all of their hosts in the beginning in San Francisco. That's not scalable, but it was necessary to start because everyone had such bad photography. I still write out, for example, all of these sales scripts and social media scripts myself. Will I do that forever? No, but for now, I still do. And you'll also have to, seven, ignore customers. Keep in mind, the goal is to make an incredible product for your future customers. Your current customers, contrarily, are more for data gathering. If they're mad in the beginning, even if it takes years for them not to be mad, then they're mad. It is what it is. There will be millions and millions more customers to come. Though also, to pull any of this together, you'll need to eight, either raise more money or you'll need to reinvest everything and not take much for yourself. You may be thinking, yeah, this all sounds good, but how do I get enough money to do this? And if you're thinking that, you're right. It takes money. Therefore, raise money or accept that you're gonna be eating rice and beans and skating along the edge for literally years. Because even if you build a plane on the way down, it needs fuel. And then finally, nine, evolve the culture. Meaning, make sure that your culture is right, right off the bat. Build a team, meaning a team, meaning almost like a family. Your first few employees will need to invest if they're going to survive all of this madness. Constantly remind yourself that the first few employees are gold because they're sticking with you even before you're a corporation with all the bells and whistles. And by the way, Reed says that there are five major stages of this process as you grow. You start with the family stage where you have less than 10 employees, then you scale up to tribe, then to village, city, family, and nation. Where in the nation, at that point, you have tens of thousands of employees, you're billions of dollars in revenue, and you're also probably an internationally important company. 
And also, of course, as you scale, as you move up this ladder, the variables, they're going to change, especially for the founder. What you do on a day-to-day -day basis is going to change. It will have to. Whereas in the beginning, you'll need to be incredibly hands-on hiring only basically generalists, jack-of-all-trades employees who can do anything you want or need. You'll eventually become almost exclusively a decision maker in the end. So that's basically how these who were they three years ago companies become household names. They confirmed product market fit with the minimum viable product of their product with a small Navy SEAL like team. Then they risked everything by reinvesting everything to scale as quickly as possible, knowing that along the way they will be incredibly efficient, smashing and breaking things all over the place. Having already jumped off the cliff, they built their airplanes on the way down. And sure, if you take this approach and you miss, it's gonna be a huge loss, true. But as long as you don't die, you'll be fine. Though if you win, not only is your world changed, but also the entire world will never be the same, especially your family and your employees. Though, so as I promised, how are we going to apply this to a smaller company? Well, the architecture is similar. So let's take a restaurant as an example. Instead of sinking $400,000 into your new restaurant idea, bring people over to your house for a dinner and test a homemade version of your recipe. Then have strangers come over your house. Then take all of your savings and get a stand at a farmer's market. Then take all of your profits from there and leverage it with debt to get a food truck. Then take those profits and go crazy on social media. You burn capital, so you then have a line down the street at your food truck, and now the local news is probably doing pieces on you. Then you take all of your profits from the food truck and you build a proper restaurant. And be totally obnoxious in your marketing to get people in the door. You got to do everything you possibly can on social media. You run local TV ads, you run local radio ads, you put up billboards, you have something free every single night to try, and then you test a game night, and then you test a poetry slam night. You test, 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 test. You do not wait knowing that once you figure out the formula, not only will you have a massive winner and everyone will know you, but you'll also have the potential to franchise your restaurant in the future. See, see the possibilities? Remember, fortune favors the bold. Or though, maybe you're not an entrepreneur, but you want to know the underlying success principle. Well, here's the deal. Reed Hoffman is not Reed Hoffman just because he's smarter than you or me. Because although he is absurdly smart, so are a lot of people. The difference is that he has completely shattered his short-term ego in favor of long-term success. Meaning, when he sees an opportunity, he not only has the courage to go after it full force, he already knows that he may look silly while doing so. In fact, this looking silly is baked into the very fabric of blitzscaling success. So even if your goal is simply to be a good father or a good mother, which it should be, by the way, for everyone, then what can we learn from blitzscaling? Well, what we can learn is that if you see an amazing opportunity for your child or your family, test the waters and go for it. Meaning maybe you'll have to spend a bit more on their education or maybe you'll have to give your kid a private coach or maybe you'll have to move to a new town or transfer schools. Maybe you'll need to go abroad. Maybe you'll need to sacrifice a little stability for the greater possibility of a future good. And guess what? That's not only okay, it can be when used correctly, the pivot which ultimately changes you and your family's life forever. So in summary, blitzscaling is a formula for how to build a company like LinkedIn or PayPal from back of the napkin to a $36 billion exit in about a decade. But it's also a glimpse into the mindset necessary for general success. Namely, perfection is the enemy. Namely, you must go all in when life gives you an opportunity. And most importantly, there is no great reward without massive risk. I hope that helped. Thank you for listening. Until next time. Cheers.